discuss the future of affirmative action, in particular the Shuki versus Coalition to Defend Affirmative Action case um, that, and, and it turns out it's Shuki and not Shute. Um, for a long time I thought it was Shute, but I've been informed by reliable sources that um, the name is Shuki. Uh, we have with us today David Oppenheimer, a clinical professor of law and professional skills at Berkeley Law School. Uh, he worked as a staff attorney for the California Department of Fair Employment and Housing, prosecuting discrimination cases, and was the founding director of the Bolt Call Employment Discrimination Clinic. He's the co-author of a wonderful case book on comparative equality and anti-discrimination law, and of the book Whitewashing Race, the Myth of a Colorblind Society. Uh, I'm also pleased to be working with David on our online course on comparative civil rights, which we hope to be to launch um, in about a year. Um, we're also pleased to welcome David Sapp, a 2005 Stanford Law School alumni who now works as a staff attorney for the ACLU of Southern California. In 2012, he received Stanford Law School's Miles L. Rubin Public Interest Award, and he's focused primarily on education issues during his tenure at the ACLU. David served as co-counsel representing the Cantrell respondents in Shuti versus Coalition to Defend Affirmative Action. And finally, um, we have, we, we we're pleased to welcome Mark Rosenbaum, the chief counsel of the ACLU of Southern California. He's been an attorney with the ACLU since 1974 and was its legal director for over 10 years. Mark is currently the Gunderson Professor of Practice at the University of Michigan Law School and has also taught at UCLA, the University of Southern California, and Loyola Law Schools. He has tried and argued numerous civil rights cases successfully in areas relating to race, gender, and education. And on March 15th, um, Mark Rosenbaum argued before the United States Supreme Court in Shuti versus Coalition to Defend Affirmative Action. Um, so our discussion today, then, will um, take our panelists in the order that I just announced them. And we would like to talk both about the Shuti case and about its ramifications for the future of affirmative action um, nationwide, and in particular in California, where, of course, uh, Proposition 209, a very similar initiative to that at issue in Shuti, has um, eliminated affirmative action in public universities. We're, um, of course, all interested to know, as it turns out, um, Mr. Rosenbaum litigated a very similar case against Proposition 209, and so we'll be interested to hear what the ramifications of Shuti will be for um, other types of, of, of um, anti-affirmative action initiatives. Okay, thank you. David, please. So hi. I want to talk a little bit about the consequences of <clears throat> the Schutte decision here in California as well as in Michigan where it arose and what it would mean if the court uh, rules that the Sixth Circuit <clears throat> was wrong and that the Michigan proposition, and as a result, the California proposition, um, is legitimate under the Equal Protection Clause, and what that would mean in terms of continuing affirmative action and university admissions. Uh, here in California, at the public university level, uh, in Michigan, again, at the public university level, and to do that, I want to talk a little bit about the Prop 209 campaign. Um, 1996, the question before the voters of California, and this is what the voters of Michigan voted on a few years later, should we stop using race and ethnicity in university admissions? That was the question put to the California voters. And the decision by a fairly narrow margin uh, was that we should. During the campaign, and, and Mark and I were both active in campaigning against the proposition, and I suspect he found, as I did, that very often when we were debating 
the merits of Prop 209, our opponents, those who favored the proposition, would say, we don't need to use race and ethnicity in university admissions. We can instead use socioeconomic class and affirmative action based on socioeconomic class will be both more fair and will give us a very good result in terms of student body diversity. Um, we've now had 15 years, 16 years, of a social experiment on whether that argument uh, was valid. And what we found is that the number of minority students, in particular the number of black and Latino students in California public universities has plummeted. And particularly the number of black and Latino students at Berkeley and at UCLA. And even more dramatically, the number of black and Latino students in the University of California law schools and medical schools. It's not that the university isn't trying to use socioeconomic class as a basis for diversity admissions. I sit on the Berkeley Law Admissions Committee. I can assure you that it is one of the many diversity factors that we look at in making admissions decisions. I can also assure you that we do not use race or ethnicity um, or sex in making those decisions because we're forbidden under the California Constitution from doing so and we take that seriously. The result is that we have many, many fewer black and Latino students at Berkeley in the law school and on the campus generally than we did before Proposition 209. Uh, and we feel that in the culture of the place and we feel that in the classroom and we feel that when we're discussing um, race, racial issues in legal cases. Um, my main course is civil procedure and of course as you all know uh, that's a course in which it's hard not to talk about race and racism as being at the heart uh, so much of the subject um, and we do so in a classroom which is far less diverse uh, than before Prop 209. If the Schutte decision is reversed um, I think that we are likely to see, first of all, we're clearly going to see that in California uh, things will continue as they are. Uh, in Michigan, um, things will revert to something like the situation in California. And it's likely that we'll see more proposition, more initiative campaigns like the 209 campaign uh, in many parts of the country. And we will see in public universities across the country a reduced number of, um, particularly of black and Latino students. Um, I think that's a tragedy. I think it's a tragedy in terms of training tomorrow's leaders. I think it's a tragedy for all of the reasons expressed in the majority decision and Justice Ginsburg's concurring decisions. In the, uh, in the Grutter case, I think that it means that we will have a society in which there is a greater racial hierarchy uh, than there is today instead of one which is moving in the direction of less racial hierarchy. Um, I hope very much for that reason that Mark's argument was successful. But I do want to say something about my sympathy for Justice Thomas's view of how we should be looking at the problem of racial exclusion in law schools like this one and like Berkeley um, and UCLA. Because Justice Thomas, in his opinion in Grutter, made a point which I think is generally ignored because it makes people like me 
that is, people who have a, a strong liberal view about the importance of racial diversity in the academy makes us uncomfortable. And years of experience have taught me that when I read something that makes me uncomfortable, I should be very careful to read it again and to try to figure out why. Um, it's the best advice I can give to a group of law students. Um, it's good to be made to feel uncomfortable. Uh, I don't mean by that good to be made to feel embarrassed in the classroom, but rather that when ideas strike you and say, oh, well, that sort of, that takes me out of my comfort zone, uh, a good thing is happening. And one of the things that Justice Thomas said in his opinion in the Grutter case is that we could solve much of the problem of the exclusion of underrepresented minorities in American law schools in one fell swoop. All we have to do is stop using the LSAT. Now, I'm saying that to a group of people who did very well on the LSAT. Uh, I'm saying that as a person who did very well on the LSAT. But the LSAT, which is a wonderful test for measuring two things, uh, analytic reasoning, well, three things, analytic reasoning, uh, reading comprehension, and uh, class status. Uh, it's good at all those things. Um, is not a particularly good test if what we're trying to do is figure out who's going to be a good lawyer. There are far better tests for trying to make that determination because being a good lawyer means more than analytic reasoning. Being a good lawyer means that you have to be a good counselor. We do a lot more counseling than we do reasoning. Uh, we try to reason with our clients when we counsel them, but you know, the process of counseling a client requires much more than just reasoning. And we don't test for capacity to be a good counselor, to have compassion, to have empathy, to be a good listener. Uh, we don't test for that at all among people when we um, look at their applications to law school. We don't test for whether people are likely to be good negotiators. We have poor substitutes when we look at leadership. If you practice law, you're in a business or you're at least in an organization in which you have terrific responsibilities. And we don't test at all for the capacity to lead an organization, to work well in an organization, to work well with other people, plays well with others. Turns out there's nothing more important. I've got three minutes, that's fine. I don't need more than three minutes because there's a test that does all of that. It's the schultz zedek test developed at Berkeley by Marjorie Schultz and Shelley Zedek that identified over a 10 year period interviewing thousands of lawyers, Berkeley and Hastings graduates, to try to figure out what are the qualities that make for a good effective lawyer. And they came up with 26 characteristics of good lawyers. And then they went back and they tested people and they asked the participants, who are the best lawyers you know? And they went out and they tested those people for their characteristics and they developed as a result a series of essentially personality tests that test for these 26 factors. And what they found in doing that work is that they could, through a two-hour multiple choice test, predict at a very high level of validity who are the applicants to law school who are likely to be excellent lawyers. And what they found when they applied the test is that there was no racial disparity. All of the racial disparities of the LSAT disappear. So I don't know where we're heading in terms of the future of affirmative action. And I hope that Mark and David were successful and that we're going to get a decision from the Supreme Court affirming the Sixth Circuit. And that's going to require the uh, California courts or the Ninth Circuit to review 209 again. 
and uh, we're going to move forward into an era in which we can again uh, look at race and ethnicity and admissions. I think that's important. I hope it happens. But regardless of what it ha whether it happens or not, we can do a lot toward curing the problem by getting rid of the LSAT and replacing it with a test that really tries to measure lawyer effectiveness. That's it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So um, I'm going to go next, and that's some, I think, some really great context for the stakes of um, what the, what this case is about. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what the facts of the case are and the legal theories um, that, that were presented to the court. So the facts of the case were that in Michigan, prior to the passage of Proposal 2, the Board of Regents of each university under the state constitution had authority, complete and utter plenary authority over the operations of the universities. So basically, the state constitution said, boards of regents run the universities, legislature has no control or say on what happens to the universities. The boards of regents had been delegated authority to set admissions policies to different uh, admissions committees and other decision makers in the university. Over the course of time, people had persuaded the universities to adopt race conscious admissions policies those policies were challenged in the Grass and the Grutter uh, litigation. The Supreme Court struck down the University of Michigan's admissions policy because it was uh, essentially put too much weight and emphasis on race as a factor, but upheld the a policy that had been adopted by the University of Michigan Law School in the Grutter opinion. And so basically all of the, a lot of the universities basically adopted Grutter style policies in the wake of that litigation. Because the opponents of affirmative action lost in the Grutter litigation, they immediately put on the ballot Proposal 2, which had previously, the exact same language had passed here in California, would, what they couldn't accomplish through litigation would ban by amending the state constitution to say that the universities cannot adopt, cannot consider race as a factor in admissions. So the consequence or, or what, what the practical effect from when Proposal 2 was adopted was that the boards of regents retained the authority to run all manner of operations at the university including admissions. They can do whatever they want as far as setting admissions. They can delegate all the authority to lower committees, admissions committees, to set the admissions criteria, except the voters of Michigan extracted the authority of the boards of regents to adopt race-conscious admissions policies. Basically, gave, left them a power to do whatever they want with respect to admissions, except race. They can't do that. So what the litigation that um, that, that we filed and that was based on the Prop 209 litigation was filed on a theory of equal protection that I'm, I'm gonna use terminology that, that court, the lower courts use in this case, which is that there's a doctrine called the political restructuring doctrine. And it's from a line of cases from 1969, uh, the Hunter case, which, in this, which was a case in, the, um, uh, in, in Ohio where a city adopted a bunch of anti-discrimination ordinances and the voters amended the charter to say that any time the city council adopted anti-discrimination laws, they couldn't go into effect until they were ratified by a vote of the people, only with respect to, to racial anti-discrimination laws. And in that case, that was challenged as violating equal protection. And the Supreme Court articulated a new doctrine that basically said, if you change the rules of the game so that a racial matter, something that inures to the benefit of minorities is subject to a different political decision-making process, that violates equal protection. And then in 1982, in Seattle, uh, local school boards adopted voluntary busing programs to achieve essentially voluntary desegregation programs that required students to be bused uh, to schools to improve diversity. And as, as soon as the local school district adopted that, opponents of busing put on the ballot a state constitutional amendment that prohibited local school boards from adopting busing practices for the purposes of desegregation. So a court, a litigation challenged that constitutional amendment. The court relied on the earlier Hunter decision and said that if you change, the, basically you take away the authority of school boards to adopt desegregated busing only, that you're creating a, a different decision-making process for a busing program that benefits minorities then that also violates equal protection. So this is what's, what's, what, what I'm gonna call the political restructuring doctrine. A, a separate set of plaintiffs filed, filed a challenge proposal two as well, and they brought what I will call a traditional equal protection claim. I think 
have a, a very in, inaccurate uh, description, uh, as I'll explain very, momentarily. But basically what they said is that Proposal 2 was enacted to hurt minorities. Mis people, Michigan did this, took away the ability to uh, consider race as a, as a factor in admissions because they wanted, because people wanted to disadvantage minorities. They didn't want to allow minorities to get into college. And how many of you are first years? Have you all had con law yet? So okay, you, people who are not first years, you have had con law, so this might make sense to you. But that basically, the, 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 um, it, subsequent to the Hunter case, so in the 1970s, the Supreme Court started to adopt, uh, to articulate a doctrine, it, it, first in Washington v. Davis, and then sub subsequently in Arlington Heights uh, decision, which basically said, uh, policies that have a disparate impact on minorities are not, do not violate equal protection unless you can demonstrate that there's purposeful intent to discriminate against minorities. So just because a particular policy that on its face is not, you know, doesn't single out, isn't focused on minorities, doesn't take away something explicitly from individuals based on their skin color, that it only violates equal protection if you can demonstrate that that apparently facially neutral law was enacted because of a purposeful intent to discriminate against minorities. And so the, what I'll call the traditional equal protection claim was advanced under the theory under, that under an Arlington Heights type of analysis that the voters of Michigan enacted this policy because of, to take away the benefit to minorities. So there are basically these two uh, parallel or two alternate theories as to why Proposal 2 violated the Equal Protection Clause. Our case included only the political restructuring theory. The other plaintiffs um, primarily relied on the traditional equal protection, but also adapted or adopted the political restructuring uh, argument as well. We lost in the trial court. On appeal, the, the Court of Appeal, based on the political restructuring doctrine, just applied a straightforward analysis based on the Hunter case and the Seattle case and said, race conscious admissions are programs that benefit minorities. In enacting Proposal 2, the people of Michigan created a distinct decision-making process so it rather, as opposed to being able to advocate to the Board of Regents, you now need to amend the Constitution. So it's a different decision-making process about a racial question, a racial matter, about whether to adopt race-conscious admissions programs, and therefore violate equal protection under, the Hunter, under Hunter in Seattle, under the political restructuring doctrine. And didn't reach the traditional equal protection theory, because they basically said, straightforward application of binding precedent, this is illegal. Now, once the Supreme Court grants review, it doesn't necessarily do you much good to say, well, binding precedent says you have to apply the doctrine in a particular way, because the Supreme Court can change its mind about precedent. So when this court granted review, we had to assess what the theory of our case was. Whereas in the trial court, in the Court of Appeal, we basically argued for a straightforward application of the political restructuring doctrine, saying, raise conscious admissions in order to benefit minorities, distinct decision-making process, it's harder to amend the Constitution than it is to go to a Board of Regents meeting. Easy application, straightforward, you gotta strike it down. The Supreme Court granted a review, and we suspect in large part because they were open to overruling or substantially limiting the Hunter and Seattle cases. And so, what I'm gonna spend the last couple minutes of my time on is just to, to, to surface what I think is, is, a, is a pretty, what to me made this case so interesting and that you know, what we hoped and really our strategy in briefing the case and arguing the case in the Supreme Court turned on pointing out an, an inherent tension in the Supreme Court's current doctrine on equal protection. So let's go back to the idea of Arlington Heights. The idea is, a, or actually go back to Washington v. Davis, you need to establish a purpose to discriminate. And what does that mean? I think that in an era of the Equal Protection Clause protects minorities from discrimination, you go back to the Jim Crow era, you go back to the Civil Rights era, the idea and understanding of the Equal Protection Clause was that we need to protect minorities from animus-based discrimination. The idea is that people take action for impermissive motivation of they don't like minorities. They're trying to disadvantage minorities by taking away benefits or uh, putting burdens on them that, or that they are putting on them because they happen to be of a particular race or ethnicity. Subsequent to the case where the court said you have to prove purpose to discriminate, the court has made quite clear, however, equal protection clause applies regardless of the race of the individual affected. So for the reason that in Grutter and Graffs, the question was, does, do race conscious admissions programs violate equal protection? 
And the idea that the plaintiffs in those cases were white applicants who claimed that they were harmed because race conscious admissions made it harder for them to get into the university. There's no evidence at all that those policies were adopted because the boards of regents dislike white people or want or, or, or to make it harder for white people to get into college. But when, when courts apply what I'll call the traditional equal protection theory to actions that disadvantage minorities, there is very often this idea of, well, there's so many other reasons why the voters might have approved proposal two. We want to end debate over race. That's not, we're not doing it because you, you want to disfavor or harm minorities. You're doing it because you want to end the toxic debate over the race. That's, that's one of the, re the arguments that the proponents made. Or that people think that you know, we don't want to have to litigate this for the rest of our lives. So there are all of these, what they call, non-impermissible uh, you know, non motivations that people might have in supporting proposal two that have nothing to do with discriminating against minorities. But what does discriminating against minorities mean? Is it that you're taking it because you don't like minorities, or is it because you're taking action because there's a program that directly benefits minorities? And so what our argument really focused on is trying to say that the idea of what it means for there to be a racial classification, we try to basically extract from the court's muddled doctrine an idea of what a racial classification was that says, if government takes action because of race, not necessarily because of the race of an individual, but because of race, in a way that increases the focus or salience of race in society, and by basically creating an entirely separate political mechanism for making decisions within the state constitution, that has actually heightened the focus on race as an important outcome determining the future of our political system, that that itself is a racial classification that's subject to strict scrutiny. So that's essentially the theory that we took in the briefing, and Mark's gonna talk about the argument as well as some of the data and what's actually happened in Michigan since Proposal 2 was enacted. Well, hi. I'm really grateful to be here. I'm very grateful to Stanford Law School with respect to this case for a couple of reasons. I did a moot court here, I don't know, three weeks ago, uh, which I totally bombed. And uh, I, um, whatever, whatever uh, the improvements were at, um, at the actual argument, uh, a significant percentage of you at this law school with the help of the professors um, and those who are present thinking about the argument itself. And I'm also grateful to Stanford for the work that I think you guys should put on the post and put up in terms of uh, uh, what this school is doing and what it should have been. I think it's interesting to um, talk about this not in terms of the, the, the doctrine. You guys are so smart. You have you know, one of us to talk to you about that. You will find that already in your time law courses or you will shortly. But to me, thinking about this case is a way of thinking about race, thinking really hard about race, not in the context, the narrow context of affirmative action. It's all about affirmative action, isn't it? But it's really not about affirmative action at all in terms of the way that the issues in this case play out in real life. And the version of what David Oppenheimer said to you is that that's really what matters. It's, it's what are we saying about ourselves and what do we um, think about race in 2013 through the Constitution, which actually is, as you know, the charter that states our national values and kind of describes who we are as a people and how we regard ourselves as a society. And one of the things over the course of the many decades that I have worked on this case and over the time that the arguments have changed and evolved and developed is that it really, um, it really says a lot about what, where we are as a nation in terms of race in 2013. One of the things that actually helped me with the move and helped me afterwards was thinking about discussing this case not in terms of broad principles. Dave laid out a, a, a lot of those, a lot more of those in our brief. But how does it work? How does it work? And I want to share with you two stories, two of which I told when I was there um, about nine days ago. The first I can tell is a quick 
but I think of Oppenheimer um, shed a little bit of light on that. In California schools, like Michigan schools, like any school that passes the Bruder test, the, 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 the test that the Supreme Court passed, we're not dealing, once, once you have a constitutionally permissible program, we are not dealing with quotas anymore. We are not dealing with individuals who get a certain amount of points based on their race, because those, those claims are already unconstitutional. You don't need to pass an amendment in the state constitution to eliminate those sorts of programs. The 14th Amendment already takes care of that. But what's left? What's left with respect to the, the plans and the policies that the proposal by Provo that you're in Bob Dylan eliminates is the following. You're in on one of these admissions panels, and you're reading these essays. And the essays are about what I, as a prospective student, can contribute to an academy in terms of educational development. And if what I can contribute is my where I was raised, whether I was raised in Palo Alto or whether I was raised in Watts, or whether it is about my alumni connections and what that means in terms of my commitment to the school, or whether it's about my religious organizations and who I am as a result of participating in those organizations, I then write an essay and I say, this is who I am. This is the individual I am, and this is what I can bring to this particular campus in terms of enriching the diversity. But, but, if my experience has been influenced in any way by my race, and I choose to identify, to identify myself in a racialized way, to say I grew up white, or I grew up black, or I grew up Latino, or however I grew up. If race made a difference, whether I'm Barack Obama or Clarence Thomas, if race made a difference, and I start to write that essay in a state that has passed a law like that, I can't do it. I have to choose a different identity for myself. I have to define myself in a way that permits me to even be considered. As David said, I, the, if the committee gets a, an essay that talks about racialized identity, they just don't consider that essay. It's as if it doesn't exist. It's as if the individual is incoherent. It's as if the individual is invisible. Or, let's think about it a different way. Both Davis talked to you about a political restructuring doctrine. And one of the things I would tell my students You know, you would do better in an architecture class than you would in my class because you need to learn how to conceptualize what a building that has a solid foundation and it's a beautiful building aesthetic and it's a building that works. You'd do better in an architecture class or you'd do better in an anthropology class because then you at least understand how cultures change, how the cultures move. What does it take to change a culture? Well, what's the restructuring doctrine? the restructuring doctrine work. And one of the things I said to the court, got a lot of help from David on this, got a lot of help from the moot courts and lawyers, far wiser than I. But how does it work? What the restructuring doctrine says, and if I lose you on this, please come back to me, it's my fault. But what the restructuring doctrine says is that a people of a state can pass a constitutional amendment. And as a result of that constitutional amendment, they can create two rooms in their legislature. One room they call racial matters, all constitutionally permissible racial matters. And in the other room, they put all other constitutionally permissible matters. And what a measure by proposal two says, where particular constitutionally permissible matters have been pulled out of the political process, have to be repealed in order to be considered. What it says is that if you want to enter the racial matter room, doesn't matter what your race is, if you want to enter that room, the state is free to, call, to charge you an exorbitant cover charge and then make you mount multiple flights of stairs just to begin the process of enacting constitutionally permissible legislation. Well, think about it this way. Two students come into a room. 
that's the room of the Admissions Committee. And they say to the Admissions Committee, we want to present constitutionally permissible factors that go to the diversity of the campus. So let's talk about one step. And the Admissions Committee asks one question. Are you here to talk about your race in a constitutionally permissible way as one factor among many defining who you are? And if the answer is yes, then the admissions committee says to you, leave the room, don't say a word, go raise $15 million, use that $15 million to repeal the, the constitutional amendment that exists, and then you can come back there and make your case. No guarantee that you'll win or lose, but just to make the case, go out and repeal that amendment and take your tens of $15 million that's required to do it and then you can talk. Whereas the other student, no matter if she's there to talk about being an oval player or an athlete or a religious individual, whatever it is, she's just told where she go. What does that say about race? What does that say about the role of race in this particular amendment? And whether or not this amendment is regarded as constitutional or unconstitutional. If the argument flipped, if the state of Michigan or the state of California and actually pass a state constitutional amendment mandating race conscious affirmative action. The argument is precisely the same. It doesn't matter which way it goes. The argument is precisely the same because what is happening, as Dave Sack just got through telling you, is that the crucial element determining how the political process is structured. And after all, what's the political process? The political process is the way we work things out, where we have free discussion, robust discussion, where we have these sorts of debates. If the region said no affirmative action, of course that would be okay. If the, the admissions committee said no affirmative action, of course that's okay. That's the ordinary, that's the ordinary political process. But what has been created is an extraordinary political process, a process that takes this issue and actually pulls it out of the sorts of debates that we typically have among ourselves and makes it impossible. You know, there's a lot of discussion about unequal playing fields and so much of what passes as constitutional debate is often what you can put on a bumper sticker. And we all know how valuable bumper stickers are in terms of advancing constitutional but in this case, if you think about this, this isn't an unequal playing field. It's two playing fields. Two playing fields altogether. One of which might as well be on Mars. I want to say one other thing, and then we can um, then we take any questions that you'd like. Dave, David Oppenheimer mentioned to you the issue about LSAT, but LSAT's core measure, as you know, is one thing, virtue of race and diversity. But even that, with all respect to Dave, right, the greatest respect for him, and this is probably the most important step in this case. One thing I would say is that even that miniaturizes what's really involved here. So Dave Sapp and I have a number of cases uh, in California. We're working on a case we're talking about as guiding the case for the next couple of weeks. We have a case where there are 20,000 children in the state of California there's a state website, state run by the State Department of Education, that takes in data from school districts, how many school districts are 961 school districts, all over the state. 251 of those school districts report to the state, which is now posted on the state website, that children in those districts receive no English learning acquisition services, even though they're all fully qualified ELT. Think about that. 20,000 students receive no services. What does it tell you about the students who do receive services in those districts? But even put that as 20,000. And we are fighting the state of California, which says that it has no responsibility to make sure those kids have services. Or I have a kid, I have a case in the state of Michigan, just outside Detroit. That's, it, it, it makes Detroit look like Stanford. 900 plus kids, 922 kids in the school district. Number of college-ready kids in that district, zero. 
number of kids who are proficient in English in that district, 3%. Math, 7%. History, 0%. So science, 0%. Foreign language, 0%. I asked kids in that school district to write a paragraph. What did they want to say to the governor? None could write a paragraph. None could. One of the, one of the kids, fifth or sixth grader, misspelled her name. Another misspelled the word teacher. Another misspelled the word wish. And it strikes me as we talk about these issues, and the kids here are terribly high. You don't, you don't need it, any of us to come here and say that. Extraordinarily high. But if we really cared about playing fields and the quality of playing fields, would there be any doubt where a case like this would turn out? And more significantly, would there be any doubt in terms of what would be the actual priorities. I, I, I just met with a uh, professor from the Hebrew Institute, just 20 minutes before I came in here. He was telling me that if the schools in Palo Alto were on an international scale, the schools in Palo Alto would be in the 64th percentile. I said, so what about schools in Los Angeles or Detroit? And he just laughed. He said, Mark, they wouldn't even be in the first percentile. All these cases, all of what you're hearing, are about race and who we are and what our, as Dave Oppenheimer said, is really the core quality of a lawyer. It's not how well you understand your case law, or how well you understand inside the heart of this case, book planning, inside the heart of how the documents are most importantly, inside the heart of what people care about and care about. Please to talk to you about the argument that, that took place on May the 13th and, and the hearings that took place. Is there any questions or questions you have? Uh, this summer I went to a panel that was hosted by um, Lula and Jim from the NAACP. They talked about the Baker v. Texas case, yeah. um, the Shelby County case. Um, and the attorney was making the point that in the Baker case, uh, they kind of talked about, well, it's not a quota system. You can say you're increasing diversity, but how do we know we have meaningful diversity? Um, you know, what's the of that? And it's obviously going to be some sort of subjective thing where you just want to know you're there, you're there. Um, on the flip side, for the Shelby County case, um, she talked about the process that Congress uses to look at which county should qualify, um, how there's a lot of research and data put into it, but at the end of the day, the Supreme Court essentially said, well, this is the data, but I feel like we've moved past you know, whatever the data says in issuing their opinion. So kind of from the fact that there's not really an acceptance of, I guess, like a subjective idea or even some sort of objective evidence. How do you go about making a case, you know, in whatever current litigation? You're so I'll try to answer your question first, and then I'll let the other side up. And during the course of the argument, Chief Justice Roberts said to me at one point, "Can't we just take race off the table? Can't we just take it off the table?" This was after, and I really invite you to read the argument, uh, not only in I said, but but the beginning, Justice Sotomayor's comments about um, Bush and Justice Sotomayor talked about. Um, the fact that um, every time minorities make gains, she said, the goalposts get moved somewhere else. Justice Ginsburg talked in, in similar terms. And I, I want to answer your question um, in a few ways. One is, I look at both the numbers and statistics. I don't really think that's the answer to, to the question. It, it is a few. When you've got at the Michigan Law School, 2.7% of the class is black. The number of kids who come from Detroit to the University of Michigan Law School, you can count on the fingers of one hand. The um, numbers of kids, the black kids fell by 33%, Latinos by 12% since it took place. But, but I want to answer your question another way, and that is to talk about the consistency of the argument that you suggested, what's going on in Shelby County, and what's going on in, in the system itself. And I think if you look at Dave's application, and that is, how do we think about race? If we structure a political process, how our democracy makes decisions, how decision makers actually look at matters, and we treat racial matters, constitutional and permissible racial matters, one way, and we treat everything else a different way, and we make it far harder, indeed we make it out of sight, to be able to pass constitutional 
understand that culture, that race is operating. It is operating separately and unequally in a way <coughs> to make certain that programs where we can intelligently and thoughtfully talk about race, they're not even, they, they're the ones that in fact, as the Chief Justice said, aren't on, aren't on the table at all. How do we know what is a diverse student body? That's the root of your oral argument in Bruder and the oral argument in Fisher. The justices have spent a lot of time on that. When it gets down to particular numbers, there is no solid answer to it. But when you sit in classrooms and there are no black students, then you know that that is not a diverse class. And so there may be extraordinary differences <coughs> on the mark. But what's happening in states like this, what's happening in the Highland Park School District I talked to, talk to you about, you don't have to be a constitutional scholar in my shoes to figure out whether or not you're diverse. And, and I, I mean, I would just add that one of the, in, in Adirondack, the Supreme Court case from 1995, um, Justice Thomas wrote in the majority of the court, um, the goal of the Equal Protection Clause is to bring society to a place where race doesn't matter, or at least it you know, doesn't matter as much. And then in another case about the re, um, gerrymandering of legislative districts in a way that created majority minority districts in North Carolina, a majority of the court said, you know, the goal of the Equal Protection Clause is to make sure that our political system isn't, it, that race is not the distinctive feature of our political system. And so what we did here is to basically try to take, they used those premises as w ways of going after pro-diversity initiatives. They, they said, you know, that's the way we're gonna get to being able to use the Equal Protection Clause to strike down stuff that helps minorities, that it promotes diversity. And what, what we're essentially saying is, okay, really? Okay, then if the whole point of the Equal Protection Clause is to say to, to us as a society that race is not the defining characteristic of who we are, how can it be remotely constitutional to have two rooms in your legislative district? And if you rule against us, you're sanctioning a state to do precisely that. That that's the kind of, you know, one of this, the tactics and sort of how we approach the argument at the Supreme Court level that we took was to basically try to show these potential contradictions. The challenge being that, of course, the court doesn't need to grapple with what it doesn't feel like grappling with sometimes. But, but that, you know, that, that's one strategy is to, is to try to point out some of these inherent contradictions or tensions within the court's doctrine because I think it's incoherent. Having worked on this case, you know, having now worked on this case and really dug into it, they're just some really odd parts of, of doctrine that are strands the court has kept completely separate that if you put them together, don't really make a whole lot of sense anymore. So I think that that's kind of what, you know, eventually trying to bring surface those and bring those together and tie them together, I think that that's one way to do it as well as talking at the values level is another way to go about it. Yeah, so I, uh, I hear the experience of my colleagues, I agree about conservative individuals who are outgoing by the law school who decided to attack my school for a further action plan. The president of my school who had worked on one of the streets as well. And they, they basically came and said a really vitriolic things about this. Um, and I never really thought of it as something so, seeing people so passionately hate a firm that. It was white and black individuals who were doing this and who were supporting this argument. I just like your perspectives on why you think this such a fierce political and moral opposition to something that to me seems like an honest attempt to address something that we all agree is important. Why, why is it so hated? We don't all agree it's important. Um, you know, just Chief Justice Roberts <clears throat> famously, and I think incredibly hypocritically said in the Seattle schools case, um, the way to end discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. This was a case where the Seattle schools had agreed to use race as one factor in trying to ensure that their schools didn't become segregated based on where people lived, uh, based on <clears throat> you know residential um, segregation. And the Supreme Court said, you can't have a desegregation plan because it means you're assigning students to schools based on race, and that's prohibited by Brown v. Board of Education. 
And the argument that comes out of that and, that, and, that, and went into it is that same argument that I hear more and more that to talk about problems of racial inequality is to be a racist because it's to be race conscious when racism and race consciousness are the same thing. And colorblindness uh, is the lack of racism and the lack of race consciousness and the lack of racism is the same thing. It's, um, for those of you who are familiar with the French view on uh, race and measuring race and measuring racism, this is, uh, it's sort of ironic that the conservatives on the Supreme Court have embraced this very French way of looking at the world. Um, but they'd be very comfortable there uh, where, um, where there's no, there's a prohibition on measuring uh, race uh, and therefore on measuring the problem of racism and therefore uh, the declaration that in France there is no racism because, see, there's no evidence of it. <laughs> As in, there are no measurements that suggest that it exists. Um, and we laugh um, uh, and we cry. Um, and, but that's where, that's where the conservative argument about race is going in the United States. There's always been enormous opposition, um, political opposition to racial equality. Um, and that hasn't changed, but the way the argument is made has changed. You know, it's such an important question you raise. The, um, part of my view on this is that there is not, in, in those who oppose, and, 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 and there are certainly very reasonable arguments on all sides of this question. But I think part of what takes place is that there's not a genuine commitment, a belief, belief in diversity as a value in of itself. One of the things I said to the court was that another message that a proposal to communicate is that even legitimate uses of race are illegitimate and that all uses of race are illegitimate and that programs that are constitutionally acceptable are really thinly disguised racial spoil system, giving somebody something what, which he or she does not deserve based on nothing other than their skin color. And I understand, particularly when you look at the way the issues are being promoted, why, why this takes place. And I also think it layers on the sense Another greater, a great inequality, and that is every kid who can make it in Stanford ought to be at Stanford or a school like Stanford. I don't think any of you, no matter how smart you are, and you are really smart, and how smart you know you are, don't think that there are so many others out there just as smart or smarter, or as David said earlier, can be just as great or greater lawyers than, than you are. You're privileged, and I don't mean that in a pejorative sort of way. I was privileged to go to Harvard. I was privileged that I I'm, had the opportunities that I have, and I'm really aware of that. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm just very aware of that. And I think some of that play, some of what's getting played out is the sense that somebody is getting something that he or she doesn't deserve, and somebody else is not. And as long as you believe that's what diversity is really about, and that's what the educational system is really about, then of course you feel that way, and of course you feel that way passionately. And what is, I think, disturbing to me is that the, the response to that is to fight programs like this tooth and nail rather than this, take a look at the, the underlying inequalities that do exist and the way, in fact, we do regard one another based on our races and the color of our skin and who we happen to be based on all sorts of labels and deal with that. It's the wrong fight at the wrong time, and the consequences are better. And as David said, what ends up happening is that you're racializing the political process more than it was ever raised. And, and to me, that the justices, some of the justices can see what's going on in these universities and feel passionately about that, but not feel passionately about setting up these two rooms in the legislature, that to me is a, a matter of, con of concern. And, and I, I think that the premise of, you know, can't we just take race off the table? You know, isn't it, isn't it okay for the people of the state to just stop the fight over race? It's such a preposterous premise. 
Do we, do, do we really think that Proposal 2 took race off the table? We had political scientists. <laughs> we had a number of, um, of amicus briefs in this case. One of the amicus briefs was done by a political scientist at University of Michigan, and he looked at data that was produced at the 2006 election. He had a rich set of data, and he and other political scientists looked at it. And what they found stunned us, and that is whatever the level of polarization is about affirmative action, the election actually increased the polarization, most likely because people recognized that it was more than a f dispute, an honest dispute about affirmative action. It was nailing something into the Constitution forever. And it actually increased the polarization by 10%. It actually was three times larger than the debate over in 1972 over busing. It was um, two and a half times greater than the debate in 1956 over Brown. It was 30 points higher than the debate over um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So as, as David said to you earlier when discussing this, in terms of balkanizing this public, in terms of, I mean, you said, what you said was so rich. You said you were shocked at how intense it was. And then put it into the Constitution. Is that a way you actually heal the nation's wounds, or is it a way that you actually open them up? And I just want to jump in really quick with one point that I think is also really important. You know, just I'm going to go ahead and admit that we're, you know it sounds like we're all on the same side here, uh, which is always fun to be in a room with everyone. Who presumably, I'm not presuming everyone in the room agrees with you, but talking with people who do. But I, I think that we run a risk of being insulated um, and, and not having a real pulse of, of what's going on out there. So just as shocked as I think you probably were at seeing, I think I know people who are shocked at how passionate we are about supporting programs like this. And I think just as much as diversity, you know, we're now talking about racial diversity, I think that very often we get polarized and, and insulated from intellectual diversity as well. And so I, I think it's absolutely critical that we, A, have these conversations across um, bound, political or ideological boundaries, but also that it's done respectfully. And that you know the, the idea of so many people that are on my side of this debate um, you know, demonize folks who oppose, who, who take a contrary view. And being myself being very personally close to people who hold the contrary view, I, I think that, that that's very dangerous. And, and I think it's important for us to you know, recognize that not everyone who disagrees with us it is, is take, coming from a perspective of an, of an illegitimate purpose. And that was the theory of the case. You know, I, I believe in the political restructuring doctrine. It was not just a tactic. It, I think the genius of it is that it keeps that debate rich and informs it and says it's important that we work this out. But by putting something at a state constitutional level, you do take it off the table. But it's not ready to be taken off the table. And nobody is going to forget it. The debate's not going to go away. It's just going to get angrier. And the frustrations are just going to mount on that. And the theory of the case is, of course, we have our own view about what, what we think is the, the correct side about it. But it's, we're not so arrogant to say that that debate itself should be silenced. And as I said, the argument is identical if, in fact, a mandate for race uh, conscious affirmative action had been passed uh, by people of the state. Question? Yeah, not all minorities, but, but blacks, Latinos, and Indians. I don't know the answer to that, but but I can guess. Um, um, you know, the when 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 um, David Oppenheimer says to you, you know, socioeconomic is often put out. It doesn't do it. Does not do the job. It's been demonstrated time and time again. But that doesn't mean that there's sufficient diversity in terms of socioeconomic groups. Nobody at this table is saying anything close to that. One, one of the arguments that opponents um, to affirmative action or supporters of these type of initiatives have, have pointed out is that actually minority enrollment increased at many of these universities. It just depends on which groups you count as underrepresented minorities. And that, it, no. that one of the problems with race conscious admissions is that they categorize different races as being privileged or not privileged or disadvantaged or not disadvantaged in ways that are demeaning and bad for society as well. So the answer to your question is that uh, certain racial and ethnic groups, the enrollment numbers have gone up substantially, 
post um, Prop 209 or Proposal 2, um, what, just as the enrollment for um, black and Latino students has declined somewhat at certain institutions or within certain programs, um, as well as probably uh, the white enrollment, but it's smaller relative terms just because the, the raw numbers are greater. So. In California, at the University of California, the, the largest recipients of the passage of 209 were white students. There was an increase in the number of Asian students, and there continues to be an increase in the number of Asian students and Latino students, although not as great as you would expect given the increase in the Asian and Latino population. Latino is probably actually dropping if you look at the number of kids who are graduating high school in the side. The, the number of Latino kids is going up in terms of high school graduates. Right. And compared to the number of Latino kids graduating from high school, the number of Latinos entering the University of California is dropping. Right. Yeah, in proportional terms. Oh, I had a, a, a quick a question. Uh, I'll take Bottery is prerogative. Um, about um, <laughs> about um, direct democracy and um, the relationship between direct democracy and the political restructuring theory. Um, because most of what you've said had to do with the setting up two rooms, and the two rooms are set up by a constitutional amendment. Um, it, 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 in one sense, it could be regardless of how that constitutional amendment is achieved. Um, and that takes certain issues off the table. But of course, any constitutional change does that, and many um, arguments against constitutional provisions that most of us, and I imagine all of you, support, um, arguments against those have been made on just this basis. It takes it off the table when, in fact, we should be having a political debate. Um, so is it just setting up the two rooms in, through constitutional amendment, or does it matter how the two rooms are set up? If there were a different process for amending the Constitution, um, would that perhaps make a difference? Uh, or is there something to be specifically worried about when it's direct democracy? Well, I'll tell you how I would answer that and how I wish I'd answered that to, <laughs> to the court. Um, uh, I'd make two points to you. One is, first of all, let's just recognize if, if the people have the final say in all instances, then there is no restructuring doctrine, right? Then the Hunter and Seattle cases that they mentioned, cases where the people change the, the rules, change the set up the, what I call the separate and ecosystems, those cases have to be overruled because if, if absent a Romer's type situation where the people are acting with animus, then the people get the final say. I, I believe in this doctrine. Uh, you get that by now, I think. I believe it's a genius doctrine, in part because I think if you think practically speaking, how you'd actually want to incapacitate certain groups. This is what you would do. You wouldn't do Jim Crow, because Jim Crow is too easy. You would do it by taking certain issues and moving it. But the issue, to me, the, the more straightforward answer to your question is, it's a functional test. It is a functional approach. You don't just ask, you know, do the people, does all power reside with the people? Well, of course it does. But that's not how the system works. That's not how the political process works. And our argument said, Let's look at the ordinary processes that are involved here. The way uh, college decisions are made. They're made with the regents having ultimate authority. They delegate that authority down. That's the ordinary process. That's, in fact, the way affirmative action happened at the University of Michigan and happened in the UC system. People who believed in affirmative action kept knocking on the door and knocking on the door, and they knew what doors to knock on to make the political process respond. This is an extraordinary. It went from the ordinary to the extraordinary. And now there are no doors to knock on in with respect to the ordinary political process. Now they have to repeal a constitutional amendment just to get back to those doors. So if the argument is framed in terms of the people wrote the Constitution, the people ratified, the, see the Constitution is ratified, the people hold the ultimate authority, then the doctrine goes by the wayside. I think it's a more important doctrine than that. It says, let's look at the way the system really operates here. And has the change been dramatic in terms of what needs to be done in order to get access to that system to make these arguments? And that's what's been changed so radically here. And I, and I think that, that that distinction also trivializes the importance of you know, the, the key feature of our constitutional democracy, which is that the Constitution is the covenant that we as the people created 
to establish the structure through which we will self-govern, including specifying in the Constitution itself which political bodies have ultimate authority over certain issues relevant to self-governance. So, of course, the people ultimately have authority. They, we can amend the 14th Amendment anytime we want. That doesn't mean that the 14th Amendment isn't the covenant we made with each other to sh govern the way that our actual government itself operates. And so the idea that just because the people can amend the Constitution, it doesn't matter that you extract only race out of the plenary authority of one of those governmental bodies still communicates that race is different and race matters in society. And so at least if you accept the premise of the more uh, of the conservative justices that have supported a more symmetrical application of equal protection, regardless of the race of the individual affected, that the ultimate purpose of equal protection is to minimize the importance of race within society and more specifically within our political system, the idea that just because the people can give it, they can take it away doesn't really hold water because they've chosen to take it away only with respect to race. We would take that risk. Um, I, you know, I, you know, I don't know that I agree with your premise. First of all, I, 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 you know, I think as a lawyer, I'm an advocate. I've been an advocate for 40 years. I'm proud of what I do, and I love what I do. But I will never make an argument that I think is unprincipled, and that I wouldn't. You know, one day I'd say one thing, and the next day I'd say another. I just won't do that, and nobody at this table would, and nobody you respect. You won't, and nobody you respect will. Practically speaking, we know the evidence is that we're nowhere close to an amendment of the nature you're talking about. This, that sort of amendment hasn't been tried anywhere because there's, you know, there, there's never a sense of, could there be, could you imagine in California a situation where this might be repealed? I think so. Um, not tomorrow, but maybe sometime. Could I imagine a situation where any time in the foreseeable future it would go in the other direction? I just so strongly doubt that that's any time feasible. Well, it, but to answer your question, yeah. yes, a great deal of thought was given to that. Um, and that I, I, I would, you know, speaking for myself, I'm not speaking for anyone else on our co-counsel team, um, that I, I, I think, though, that, that, you know, one, this is the argument that um, we made. Uh, this is the theory that we had, and that we had the duty to our clients to, to try to preserve it and make an argument that would fly in the Supreme Court, which which we came up with the best theory that we thought we could. More importantly, you know, just as a non not as a lawyer, but as a movement <laughs> lawyer, the idea of wanting such an amendment to take place, I think, would be extremely dumb <laughs> from a strategic perspective for all the reasons why, you know, Mark and I believe that this doctrine matters. What that would communicate and the you know, problems that it would cause among people who are so passionately opposed to that and what that would mean as far as fragmenting society further, I think that there is a reason why this doctrine is actually a sound doctrine um, in, in that respect. And so the idea that just because we might get to a day where we could wield the power to, to do it, um, you know, that, that's, that's not something that I personally would be particularly interested in supporting anyway. You know, it's a, it's a version isn't enough of the diversity discussion that we've had. And that is, I, I do believe it in the political process. I don't think it works very well or very often. That's why we file cases that, that we do. But, but the, the sense that you would incapacitate the process to have the sorts of debates. And, and as we know, there's not two sides to a debate. There are infinite sides often to a debate. And if the debate can go to the direction of, let's do something about K through 12 schools, let's do something about other class, you don't want to be stifling that debate. And so for all sorts of reasons, if that happened, uh, I wouldn't say I'd be the lineup to be the first person to file the case. But that doesn't mean that I wouldn't, I, I couldn't brook that as, a, as a, a, a viable and as a healthy thing for a democracy. Or to put it slightly differently, 
if you were to tell those of us who are on the faculty at the University of California that we are now required to adopt a certain policy in terms of admissions and, um, and that we must use racial diversity as a factor in admissions, that might be the only way you could get a very liberal faculty to revolt against some kind of affirmative action and be calling Mark <laughs> at the ACLU and saying, will you represent us because this is a critical matter of academic freedom. Um, what we want is to be able to develop our policies um, that we think are the best policies for our university and our state. Well, with that, I, this has been fascinating. And I, you can see we could go on for another hour, but we can't go on for another hour because someone Probably else class. wants to class it. Um, so thank you so much to our distinguished panel. <laughs>